Welcome to a video on the relationship between teachers and racism. As the effect of racism is both felt and permeates over time, this is a story about the average Aboriginal student. According to Creative Spirits research, 60% of Aboriginal students are already significantly behind non-Aboriginal children in year one. 36% of Aboriginal people don't have access to a library in remote communities and only 10% graduate from year 12. 18% failed to reach the minimum reading and writing standards. Half of all Aboriginal students in the NT achieve below the minimum national numeracy standards. As adults, 46% of Aboriginal people are considered functionally illiterate. Only 1% of teachers in Australia are Aboriginal, while in the NT, 39% of students are Aboriginal people from many nations. The government recently proved and admitted that the gap is opening. These statistics are education related but contribute to deficit thinking that can reinforce disadvantage. While undeniable, they don't measure quality or perspectives and don't show a complete picture of the advantages of, for example, living as part of an extended community or being close to nature. Also, this is statistical evidence of disadvantage and not evidence of current racism. Although it is undeniable that the causes relate to past racisms, including the slow transition from overt to institutional. So as white people, although we may claim not to be racist, we are, because we have been. Our role is to admit that we are part of a system that while providing opportunities and having good intentions, fails to engage and contextualize the curriculum in the mainstream education system. Promoting the idea of complicity makes people accept that change is warranted. We can respectfully negotiate under democratic principles seeking consensus and agency. We negotiate what I call the terms of freedom. Applying democratic principles and seeking to avoid elitism, teachers can rule against aggression and bigotry while merely expediting democratically agreed upon rules and processes. Teachers can achieve true equality and fairness, at least in the context of class interactions. We need to model for our students a logical disapproval of all wordings that are unfair, unkind and unconstructive, starving racism of its fuel. That is, as Edmund Burke said, that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. When it comes to derogatory remarks and oppression by any students, racism is usually not far behind. When I hear an Aboriginal student saying the C-word, I like to ask him how they would feel if a white person called them the N-word. Celebrating Aboriginal and other cultures and using these to contextualize the curriculum fosters pride in Aboriginal students which act as a lifelong shield. Helping all students empathize with Aboriginality dispels myths and humanizes. Most racist remarks and thinking on both sides festers in mostly familial and monocultural ignorance, misplaced blame, bigotry and arrogance. Constructively, teachers should strive to see the perpetrators of racism as victims, of at least ignorance. Without questioning the validity of a bigoted remark directly, teachers should, openly and without judgment, explore their effects on a victim. They should then fill knowledge gaps around context in hope of making impact through the teachable moment. All curriculum should include elements that combat bigotry. For example, when the ugly head of racism has been reared, the teacher can spontaneously intervene with this extra contextualized classic framework around a lesson. As created in 1968 by Jane Elliott to cope with the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the teacher arbitrarily creates a metaphoric caste system following the division of the class. They enforce the idea of superior-inferior based on an absurd class randomizing factor such as students with or without jewelry. Students need to agree to participate in this experiment. The teacher will continue the lesson, but will strategically, gradually incorporate disparagements, terms of deficit and sarcasm. They can refer to them as special, belittling with brave answer, while to the adorned they can sincerely say, keep trying, you're almost there. The teacher needs to be smart not to cross any lines and keep observation subtle and authentic to the situation, issue and language. They do not need to target the offending individual, but do need to follow up the lesson with an open and prompted discussion. The bigger lesson is that any student should stand up next time they are tried to make accomplices out of, or the next time they hear a bully, bully. We should keep in mind that grouping students in any way should only serve to further their education directly. 
We should reflect on normative practices and terms of deficit at all times. After all, the systems that teach represent a culture that seeks to integrate people into society. In many cases, this comes at the expense of one's own race, which makes normalization practices and ACARA standards racist to some degree and to a perspective if not subject to interpretation. Institutional racism starts to dissolve with critical vigilance and actions around deficit thinking, normalizations and authentic negotiated expectations. Paula Freire's problem-posing method, combined with his critical race theory, examines the system the teacher needs to represent and embody. This reflection practice, combined with authentic dialogues that explore and build on students' thematic universe, help create a fair, just, and intrinsically motivated society. Our praxis as teachers needs to unroot racism systematically, in a way that one day it may impact on the average Aboriginal student.